Man, you can be seated this morning. How many of you believe that we serve a do-it-again kind of God? The same God that has brought you to this moment has a new moment ahead for you. The same God who moved mountains, did miracles, offered grace and salvation to a world that was fallen and could never achieve a relationship with a God that's so perfect is the same God who wants to meet and speak with you in this moment today. Does that make anybody else excited? What also makes me excited is this good-looking crowd in this place today. Look at somebody and say, you look nice. Just tell them, you look nice. Just a good-looking bunch. Well, I want to talk about that very faithful God, and so today, if you brought your Bibles, your electronics, iPads, whatever you've got, look at 1 Peter, the book of 1 Peter chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4, and I often say, if you've heard me preach before, I think every passage of the Bible is my favorite passage, but this one really, I'm serious, <laughs> hold on, <laughs> This one really is near the top of the list. There's a verse in this passage that goes to bed with me and wakes up with me every single day. And I can't wait to share it with you today. I think it's a perfect kickoff to this new series. We are starting a new series and emphasis. We do that here at church. If it's new to you, maybe it's a New New Year's resolution for you to be in church. It's a great time to be at Blackhawk because we are starting off what we just call a new series. It's just a focus for the first three months of this year. We will be talking about making disciples. And I want to talk to you about shift because I want us to look at what God may want to do inside of you and me to shift things around a little bit, to shift some priorities, maybe back towards what he has in mind for your life. Can't think of a better way to start a new year of 2018. Can I get an amen? And so in this series, we're going to look in just a few minutes at 1 Peter chapter 4. But before we do, I want to outline what we're doing as a church. What's the overall goal of this series is the first thing I'll tell you about. And it's simply this. I want to facilitate a conversation. That's really our ultimate goal in this series. I want to facilitate a conversation that centers around our mission that centers around what we're called to do and be as the church. Because if you know Jesus today, who is the church? You're the church. We are the church. It is not this building. It's not the different structures around the world that people use to gather. We are the church. And so we're going to look at what it means to be the church. So I want to facilitate a conversation to keep us focused on what really matters. Because if you ever noticed that life gets busy and it's easy for the mission to creep over into things that maybe are more my personal agenda than the mission that Jesus established from the beginning. So I want to facilitate a conversation. But here's what I want. We're going to do this church-wide, our life groups. Every now and then, we're going to get together, and we're going to have a church-wide immersion. We're going to immerse ourselves in a topic. This is just such a case. So all of our life groups are going through a study together through this series. I want to invite you into it. I'll tell you more about the book and the resources for all that. That's less important than the why. The why is I want to facilitate a conversation that happens here on Sunday mornings, that happens in all of our life groups. Life groups are just small groups that gather throughout the community or here on our campus throughout the week. We have them available seven days a week here at Blackhawk. That conversation will bleed over into those groups, but that's not even my ultimate goal. My ultimate goal is that this conversation that we're entering into about disciple making called shift would enter your dinner table conversations, would go to your workplace, would show up when you talk to your kids before bedtime, would show up when you have that difficult moment with that difficult person that constantly just slows you down in this new year with the resolutions and where you're trying to go and the fractured and broken relationships, I pray this conversation would show up there. So I want to facilitate a conversation. Now, what we're doing as a church is we're going through this book. This is a great resource, and a lot of people are saying, are you going to preach from the book or the Bible? (laughs) Well, this book is centered around the Bible, and so we're going to go straight to the Bible. And I want to tell you, why are we going through this book and how you can get one of these? First of all, you can purchase it on Amazon, uh, or you can purchase one in our foyer. They're easy to get a hold of, and I'll tell you this. If you can't afford one, we're selling for $10 here. It gives you a discounted way to purchase those. If you can't afford one, we believe so much in this conversation that we're about to have that we will give you one. 
And so that is our offer to you. So why this book? Is it because some church real life ministries or some of the authors of this book that they've come up with this cute little system that we're going to try to copycat and be like here at Blackhawk? No. It's because in this book, here's what I've found. It's one of the best resources I have found that gives us a framework and a context and a portrait of how Jesus made disciples. Because I've learned in the church, it's so easy to talk about what Jesus said without actually doing what Jesus did. It's easy to read the words from the page and say, yeah, I want to be that way in my life, but then real life happens on Monday. Can I get an amen? It's easy to talk about what Jesus said, but actually not do what Jesus did. And this resource gives us a great biblical look into how Jesus himself made disciples and modeled that process for us. Secondly, not only does it give us a good portrait there, it's also going to give us a unified track to run on as a church so that we can be looking at the same stuff, going through the same scriptures. I'm going to, it's divided into weeks, and there's five days in each week. I'm going to be preaching. I'm on week one today. I will get there, I promise, but you need to know where we're going first. Uh, Today, I'm going to be preaching the week one topic with some different scriptures that may or may not overlap with the exact discussions you've had at the dinner tables or your life groups, but that's why we're doing that. A unified track, facilitate that conversation because it really gives us a great look at the Bible's take on what Jesus did in terms of making disciples. Everybody with me so far? Let me answer the last question. You need to know what has gotten us to this point. And this is not just a new series. You should know that our life group leaders, our shepherds, our deacons, our elders have all gone through training over the course of the last 12 plus months to get us to today. Today, it feels like a privilege. I'm kind of excited. Can you tell? I'm just pumped to get to this point because we have poured in many hours, much study, much preparation as a church so we can be unified around this all-important thing that's our mission. But what's beautiful about it is it's not just important for the leadership of your church to be unified around it. It's important that we're all unified around it because we're all called as ministers and leaders and influencers for Jesus. And so we've gone through training to get to this point. I have personally walked through, our life group leaders have done training. There is a life group manual that looks like this. Uh, If you're ever a life group leader here, it walks you through all of our philosophies of how we lead groups, why we lead groups, some of the systems around that. We've gone through that. That has been developed with these principles in mind. But I've also walked through this whole book, this whole study with our elder leadership team, With our staff team, our whole staff has gone through that over the last three months leading up to today to prepare for going through this with you. Our life group leaders are now equipped. We've met, gotten together to equip them to lead you, to lead our whole church through this study. I'm facilitating the conversation from this stage, but really the study, the nitty gritty details of how the rubber meets the road is going to happen in our life group. So it's a great time to find one of those. I'll talk some more about that as well. So they're ready to lead you through that study. And I want you to know, I am actually walking through it again. I got a fresh book and I'm going through it again with you, just so you can see proof is in the handwriting, this chicken scratch as it's called. I'm going through it again week by week with you as we go through this conversation. So all that makes sense? My prayer, you got to do better than that. All that makes sense? Let's do this. I'm excited about this study, and what I really hope to see is that this process is going to challenge some things. It's going to challenge our priorities. It's going to challenge our resources as a church. It's going to challenge our leadership structures, our personal behaviors, and our own agendas to maybe shift a little bit back towards God and what he has. And we're going to go from what I like to call accidental discipleship to intentional discipleship. A lot of times in churches, we do a lot of really good things, have a lot of really good programs, and along the way, we make disciples. Not bad, biblical, great, because disciples are made. But what could happen if we go back to doing things the way Jesus does things? And I'm not saying you're not. You're probably doing it way better than me. But I think we can all do better. Can I get an amen? Because things tend to shift away from what they were intended to be as we follow Jesus. But I believe this is going to challenge our hearts, challenge our mindsets about life. And we'll go from accidentally making disciples, because we do a lot of really good stuff, to intentionally being like Jesus every single day and weaving his call and command into our life, threading it through our workplaces and our homes, our visits to the grocery store, our coming to church and our life groups in a way that it changes our life. That's what I hope we can see and believe we will see as a church. And I'll tell you, when it comes to the church, I'm a church kid. I'm a PK. 
grew up in the church. I love the church. I love the local church. I love that I grew up in church. But my best experiences in life and my worst experiences in life has happened and have happened in and through the church. Some of you have been hurt by the church in a way that you find yourself surprised you're even sitting in the building with me right now. It's a reality. You don't know why? I can tell you exactly why you were hurt. You say, you don't know me. You're right, I don't, but I know church really well. You know what I know? You were hurt because the church is filled with, are you ready for it? People just like you and just like me. But I believe some healing's coming today. I believe God brought you to this moment to get maybe a fresh look at how Jesus wants to meet you in the midst of this thing that he built. Some people say, well, I can follow Jesus without the church, to which I would say, no, you can't, because, not because I say so, but because Jesus said, I'm going to build my church, and even the gates, in hell, uh, gates of hell won't prevail against it. The church is the vehicle that Jesus chose and established and built and is building to carry his mission to a world that so desperately needs the good news. And so you can't truly plug into the intentions and the mission and the purpose and the methods of Jesus without plugging into the church. Not what some of you wanted to hear, but I think there's some refreshing ways you can look at how to do just that. Some of my greatest experiences happened in the church. When I first got into ministry, Jessica, my wife, and I started what I like to call a bus ministry uh, using a four-door sedan Nissan Altima. And we went in our community all over the place and picked up kids, made trip after trip after trip. And I didn't know what I was doing. I started ministry when I was 17 years old after telling God the one thing I would never do or be as a pastor like my dad be careful what you tell God you'll never do, because there I was. And so we started this bus ministry with a little four-door car, and we picked up these kids, and they were coming to know Christ, and we were baptizing kids. But they also made a mess <laughs> in the fellowship hall, we called it. They spilled drinks. They tore up the sheetrock. We tried to take care of the place, but, you know, I mean, how many of you were kids before? That was, that was you, by the way. You missed your cue. Everybody's with, we were all there, and you know what I'm talking about. Kids are kids. And so, but then we started bringing kids that didn't have a skin color that looked like mine, and some people didn't like that, and they didn't like the mess that all the kids were making. And we had this guy in a church that I served that we called the cussing deacon. I'm not kidding. We don't have any of those, I don't think, around here at Black Hawk. If we do, please let me know. Um, <laughs> Because I've met that guy before, and literally I have been cussed out by a leader in the church as this 17, 18-year-old youth pastor for bringing kids in that were tearing up the walls, making a mess, and that this church was not meant for people who have a different skin color than mine. And I was disgusted by ministry. And I quit and said, God, and I shook my fist at God. And I said, God, this is exactly why I said I would never be a pastor. I told you. And God just had grace and patience for me, and I went and just served the church for a while, thinking I'd never go back into vocational ministry, but God wouldn't let me alone. And he said, you're going to go and be a part of the solution. And I went back into ministry, never knowing I would end up moving across the country to pastor a church like Black Hawk. But here we are. I love the church, but I've seen it at its worst. I've seen it at its best. And I believe that some amazing days are ahead of us here at Black Hawk yeah. as we have this discussion. And I believe somebody in here can really identify with me because you've been hurt. You've seen the church at its worst too. But I believe the same God who built and established the church to begin with is going to do it again. He's still faithful. He hasn't given up on you. And you, I want to challenge you with me to not base, hear me, this is going to change how you look at church if you can embrace and own this. Don't look at the church through the lens of its people. Look at the church through the lens of the one who founded it. And that's none other than Jesus. Because while the people in his church will let you down, I'm your pastor and I'm human and I'm so imperfect and I will let you down. I'm so far from perfect. Don't look to me and put me on a 
pedestal, put Jesus up there and look at his church through the lens of him who created it and started it and asked you to be a part of it, not through the lens of what I can bring to the table or what you can bring or those other people that may have hurt you. And it'll change the way you engage with the church. Some of you came just to hear that today, but there's more. I want us to start talking about this conversation today. And what I really hope for is this. You wonder, what is this ordeal over here? This is a defibrillator. If you don't know what these do, they shock your heart back into rhythm. Should you find yourself in cardiac arrest or find yourself in need of that, then I'm far from a medical professional, but I do need a volunteer. Why is nobody moving? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I've got one taker. One guy. We know who the most courageous soul in this place is. And this is the real deal. We got to use this today. I'm going to turn it down. But what you do with these babies, who's ready? You shock. It sends a pulse, a shock to the heart. And it shocks the heart back into the originally intended rhythm that would make you a healthy, functioning human being. What I really hope that God's about to do today and through this series is that he'll shock some hearts back into rhythm, that he'll shock and shift some hearts back into place in a way that maybe you'll see the church in a new way. Maybe you've been here at the church for a long time. Maybe you think you have discipleship figured out. I would submit to you, unless you're doing it exactly like Jesus did, you still have a long way to go. And God wants to maybe put a pulse into your heart and shift your heart around in a way that maybe it's going to shock it back into rhythm. Maybe the health that once was, or maybe a health that you've never had inside your heart spiritually is now going to be attainable in your life because you ran into this defibrillator called the church, called the Word of God, and it changed your heart. And it shifted some things back into order. Anybody ready for some shifting around today in this place? Let's talk about some heart shifts necessary for making disciples. Week number one is a heart for making disciples. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 4. This is where we're going as a series. Now that you know, let's start with that first topic. And I want to give you three shifts of the heart that are necessary for making disciples. The first one comes from verses 8 and 9 of 1 Peter chapter 4. And it is this, from me. Somebody say me. It's easy to do that, isn't it? But it's a shift from me to we. Somebody say we. The church is all about we. The church is a team sport. We're all in this together from me to we. First Peter chapter 4, I'm going to start in verse 9 as Peter writes this. Above all, he says, must be pretty important. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Verse 9, show hospitality to one another without, without grumbling. But love covers a multitude of sins. And above everything, keep loving one another earnestly. It's a we thing. We've got to go through it together. The Christian life, I want you to know, is never meant to be lived alone. Some of us, though, have navigated our way through the Christian life trying to avoid people at all costs. In ministry, going through seminary, it was often said that ministry would be easy if it wasn't for the people. It also wouldn't exist. The mission that Jesus came to accomplish also would go away because the people were the mission that Jesus came for. And can I give you a statement about your spiritual walk? And the statement's this, if you avoid people, you're going to miss out on the best that life has to offer. If you avoid people, you're going to miss out on the best that life has to offer. My worst experiences in life, in life have come because of people and surrounding people, but so have my best experiences in life. Meeting some of you has been one of the greatest experiences of my life, this some just under 18 months that my family has been here. But if I avoided it, Jessica and I have talked several times about what would it have looked like if we were afraid and wouldn't have taken the step to move, and we wouldn't have known the people. That's what we came back with. We didn't come back with all of these different things. Well, this happened and that happened, and we raised this money. No, it was about the people. 
It's about the people whose lives have been impacted. People like right here in front of me. I just see so many faces. I've done your weddings. I've baptized you. But it's not about me doing any of it. It's about what God's been doing in your life and me getting to walk with you. It's about the people. You'll miss out on the best experiences of life that God has intending for you to go through and to offer to you if you avoid people in your life. So maybe your shift is from me to we. Verse 8, love covers a multitude of sins. And in your notes, you'll find, you can take notes, by the way. We gave you a note sheet as you came in. You can do it on our app. Or if you just even act like you're taking notes, nobody's going to know the difference. They'll think you're an engaged student, but you can just dig in. But in your notes, there's a statement, and it's this. A heart that shifts must also stretch. And so I believe God's going to stretch somebody's heart Because if love's going to cover a multitude of sins, then God's also going to take your heart. Are you ready for this? This is the part that hurts a little bit, and he's going to stretch it. If it's going to cover a multitude of sins, he's going to stretch your heart. He's going to grow you in ways that only he could do. A heart that shifts must also stretch. I pray that our heart could break for the things that break the heart of God. Not the things that I want, but for his agenda, the things that he desires. That's the love that covers a multitude of sin. Have you ever noticed that your love doesn't really cover a multitude of sin? The sin seems to win when you do it through your love, doesn't it? You've tried that in relationships, right? And it just doesn't go very far. But today there's a love that's deeper, love that's stronger, a God who is faithful and wants to meet you in the midst of your mess in such a way that his love will then spill out and spill over into all of the fractured, broken relationships that you thought of when I said we need to shift from me to we. You thought of some, didn't you? Or unless you have all the perfect relationships, you've got all of yours lined up perfectly, right? No, because they're people and you're people and people tend to hurt people. And You know what I've learned too? The people that have hurt me the most, I've found if I've really cared enough about them to find out that they are often the most hurt people because hurt people hurt people. Some of you are in that boat today. I think you're going to find some healing for the hurt. But can you humble yourself enough to receive it and let God do a work in you through that love that is still true and available to you. Did you hear me when I said that? It is still true and available to you in this place today. Somebody needs to know that because you don't fully believe that. I believe God's going to work in your heart in a way that will lead you to that very spot. Verse number nine says, show hospitality to one another. We try to be a kind of church that welcomes people well at Black Hawk. Hopefully, if you're new with us, you were greeted. You couldn't get in here without talking to some people. If you did, we apologize, and we want to change that. We want to be a church that shows hospitality to people without what? Without what? Without grumbling. And if you ever want to see a pastor whose love doesn't cover a multitude of sins, let, I'm just, can, I, can I be real with you for a minute? You said, I don't know. I'm not sure what we're getting into. I'm going to do it anyway. So you're kind of a captive audience right now, aren't you? If you want to see a non-pastor-like person, let me hear a story of somebody who may be just trying the church out for the first time. They've been hurt by a church and then hear the story that they sat in a seat that was some self-assigned seat and somebody walked up to them and said, hey, I'm sorry, but that's my seat. Can you move? <sighs> Let me tell you, Blackhawk, there are no assigned seats in this place. And I pray with all of my heart for a day, and I believe today may have been that day. I know I may be stepping on some toes, and maybe it needs to happen today. I don't know. But I pray for a day where the self-assigned parking place that maybe you lose or the self-assigned seat that every week you come in and self-assign yourself a new seat that is taken up by somebody else because people are coming to hear the gospel. And I pray for a day where we who have been called, we who have walked this journey, and we call Black Hawk home, that we pray we get to stand in the back because not only is our seat taken, but every seat is taken, and we end up having 10, 12 services to fill this place up with others who want to hear the gospel. That's what I want to see in this church. Who's with me? It's not your seat. Look at somebody say, it ain't your seat. And I pray that if you lose your seat, you say, I'm so glad somebody's filling it. And I'm so glad I get to sit beside my seat with you to hear the good news of the gospel today. May we be that kind of church, one who shows hospitality to others without 
grumbling. Because what that means is that we have to start saying, I don't really care about what's different about you. I care about what's the same about you. Did you hear me? That's so important because that'll change how you look at people going from me to we. I need to care more about what's the same about you than I care about what's different about you. That's when skin colors don't matter anymore. That's when who we voted for, you ready? Who we voted for doesn't matter anymore, whether we're red or blue or Democrat or Republican or we have this background or we make this much money. All of that goes away and disappears at the foot of the cross because what we have in common is a need for Jesus. That's what the church is all about. It's not about our differences dividing us. It's about God taking different people with all of our differences and uniting us around one cause. And that one cause is none other than Jesus Christ and the gospel that applies to everyone in the entire world. That's why we exist. That's what Jesus had in mind when he established his church. And I praise God I get to be a part of that. Is that not an exciting thing for you and me? Can you tell I get excited about this topic? I hope that you do as well. And I want you to know, folks, you may have had a bad experience at Black Hawk. I know Black Hawk's not perfect. You want to know how I know? I have two really good reasons why I know Black Hawk is not perfect, because I'm the pastor, and I know me. I, I meet me every day, and I don't like I know. She said, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's what I say. That's what I'm talking about. I know me really well. I know Black Hawk's not perfect because I'm the pastor, and you're in it. We're not perfect, are we? But you know what? That's another thing that we have in common. And God takes our imperfections, and at the foot of the one who is perfect, makes it all okay, makes it all right. Not because what we did is okay, because our sin separates us from God, but because he came and paid for that sin. And he made it all okay by the power of his blood. He washed us as white as snow with that crimson flow, that blood that we sing about. That's why we talk about it so much, because apart from his blood being spilled out, our imperfections doom us. You guys got to listen a little faster. I want to read Hebrews. You don't have to turn there. Stay in 1 Peter, but I want to read Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 and 13 to you. When it talks about this concept of we, this is such a foundational principle for this entire three months leading up to Easter as we do this as a church the writer of Hebrews says, Hebrews 3, 12 and 13, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. Anybody ever had one of those before? Leading you to fall away from the living God, verse 13, but exhort one another, underline that, but exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is deceptive and it's deceitful and the drift starts within. It starts with the heart. That's why he talks about the heart. But he says, love one another. We said above everything else, love one another earnestly in 1 Peter 4. Now he's saying, take care lest there be this unbelieving heart leading you to fall away. But exhort one another. That word exhort means to encourage. It means to urge strongly. It means to appeal to. It even could be interpreted as to beg. It's that strong of a word. And it says to do that with each other every single day. And some of you said, well, I can't really do a life group because they meet every week and I can't be telling my business to everybody every week. What was this writer is saying, what the word is telling you today is that you need people, is you need somebody to be all up in your business. Some of you said, great. That doesn't mean you gossip. That doesn't mean you do it with an impure motive. That means you say, I'm so broken and I love you too much not to tell you the truth. Here's what I'm seeing in your life. Whether you like it or not, you need that. Whether I like it or not, and can I tell you a secret about your pastor? I don't like it. I'm an introvert at heart. I recharge by alone time. I never have liked life groups because they make me talk and have discussions that I'd really rather just not have. There, I said it. But can I tell you, some of the best moments of my life have come from community. That's what we say, biblical community. The best moments of my life have come from community where I step through my fear, step through that barrier. And I'll tell you, at Blackhawk, I have such a community around me with our leadership, with our staff, with you, with groups. I feel so accountable. And it's a good thing. 
It feels good. How, how can it be that we could say accountability feels good, but it does. We need each other. We've got to shift from me to we. We're to be a one anothering church. I believe in us being a one anothering church. Life is better together. We believe that. We say it often. And here's why I often tell you that this is not enough. I believe that with all my heart. And I would even make a bold statement. I want you here on Sunday mornings. This is important. This is a call of God for us to gather corporately and worship God together as a church. But if you, have, if you just absolutely couldn't do but one thing this week is go be in community in a life group or come to a church service, I would unequivocally say go to your life group. It's that important. But I think you can do both. We desire to be kind of church where what we ask of you is be in a worship service, be in community, be in a life group, and serve somewhere. Don't care how. We've got a hundred different venues and ways for that to happen. We try to make that easy for you, but that's what we ask of you when you join, when you jump in here at Blackhawk, and so that's what I pray we can do. And why is this not enough? It's because a row can't know. A row can't know. You can be pretty anonymous in that row, can't you? A row can't know. Look at somebody say, a row can't know. Tell them, you don't know. You don't know. But when you get in a circle... People tend to know, don't they? And it changes my life because somebody knows my business and cares enough about me. They're not going to care perfectly, just so you know. You won't either. But it puts us in this thing called community that changes everything. We want to be in one another in kind of church. And by the way, if you don't have a life group, we want to help you find one. We've got them seven, day, seven days a week happening at Blackhawk and in our community surrounding us right now. And one of the ways you can do that is this coming Wednesday. Rick Raber is right over here. Rick, raise your hand. He's our lead shepherd. Is going to be facilitating a group, particularly for and anybody's welcome, but particularly for those who are not in a life group at Blackhawk. You can come Wednesday at 6.30, meet up in the foyer, right out those doors, and you're going to go through this study that we're all going through together, but it's with the purpose of helping you know more about life groups so that by the end of that 12 weeks, we can help you find a life group that fits your schedule and needs at your decision. It's your choice, but we're here to walk with you on that journey. Sound easy enough? From me to we. Let me share the last two with you. From me to we. Secondly, is from the stands to the field. How many of you are good at watching sports? Go dogs. You knew I moved from Georgia, right? So it's kind of a big day coming up for Georgia. I'm good at being in the stands, but you know what I've learned about Christianity is I'm pretty good at being an observer in Christianity as well. Can I tell you, if you thought your spiritual gift was observing, there's not a gift called it's observing. <laughs> there's this concept from the Bible called the priesthood of all believers. It means you're a priest. It means you're a minister. It means you are called to ministry. Ephesians chapter 4, almost preached some of it today. Definitely not time for that today. For another day, I preached it here. But it gives a clear picture of, of direction for the church, both for church leaders and those in the church. And for a pastor, what it tells me is that my main call is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Now, that means I'm to be a coaching player. That means I get in the game. It doesn't mean I get to observe either. It means I live it and do it, but I coach and lead and release people and equip people to go and do the same with their life. That's the call of my life. But for the church, for you, it says equip the saints. That means the primary execution, the primary vehicle through which disciples can be made happens by the work of ministry that's done by the saints. You ready? You are the saints. We are the saints because we are the church. And I'm not talking about the NFL kind. I'm talking about the kind that you've been transformed by Jesus and you've gone from sinner to saint. You may still sin. You may still look like a sinner in the mirror. But when God looks at you, if you know Jesus today, he sees the clear blood of Jesus over your life and he sees you as white as snow. You're a saint. You should shout about that. Some of you don't believe it, perhaps, though. But when you read the word and let Jesus take you through life. You'll go from the stands to the field. And what I love about verse 10, look there with me back in 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 4. It says, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Mm. But no, verse 10, here's that verse that gets up with me every single day, and it's verse 10. And it says, as each has received a gift, use it. Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. 
And I get emotional almost every time I read that verse because I don't deserve to receive God's grace, much less to be a steward of it. But there's information and initiation in that verse. The information is that you have received a gift. If you know Jesus Christ, if you've surrendered your life to him, the power of the Holy Spirit has given to you a gift, at least one. That's the information. You're gifted. You're called. You're a part of the team. The initiation is two simple words, but as each has received a gift, what was it? Use it. Somebody say it with me. Use it. Some of you have been sitting on your hands, been sitting on your gift. Use your gift. The information is that you've been gifted. The initiation is that you're supposed to use the gift that you've received to what? To faithfully serve one another. Again, it's from me to we. It's about us together, walking through life together. But then the last part is what gets up with me every single morning. To use it, to faithfully serve one another as what? As a steward. What is a steward? You've got to talk to me a little. I preach way better when you talk. And I preach shorter too. I bet I'll get some talking now. What's a steward? A manager. Other words? Pretty good. We're going to go with that then, huh? A manager. That's good. What was it? A servant? Absolutely. Say again. A trustee. trustee. Oh, that's good. It's not mine. A trustee. That's really what it is. A steward is one who manages something that's not our own. If you're stewarding something, it's not mine, but I hold on to it for a while. I take care of it. So read the verse again. We're to, we, we're, we've each received a gift, so we use it to serve one another as stewards of God's varied grace. I get to be a manager. I say it this way, a giver-outer. Really theological term. It should be in a theological dictionary journal somewhere. I'm sure it's not, but I'm going to write that one one day. A giver-outer, an administrator, a manager of God's grace. I don't deserve to be given the grace of God, much less to be a manager of it. Yet God says, here it is. I trust you with that grace. Go be a manager of it. Go give it out to other people. You get to represent me to the world. The church is the vehicle that Jesus built when he said, I'll build my church, and even the gates of hell can't prevail against it. That's what we're tasked with. Does that just get anybody in the gut? That'll shock your heart back into rhythm, won't it? That'll give you a gut check, but that's what we're called to do and to be as the church. In Matthew 28, we heard a little about it last week, is the Great Commission. He says, go therefore, as Jesus leaves this earth after he's risen from the dead, go therefore into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit like we did today and teaching them to observe all things that I've given to you. And lo, I'm with you always. It's the great commission. Go, the word go, the literal translation is actually not just go. It's really as you are going. The word go really means as you are going. And so that means discipleship, our call, our commission to shock our heart back into rhythm, to be healthy again, may mean that discipleship and making disciples and being a disciple doesn't just happen on Sunday mornings from this little morning time frame until I get to go to lunch and the pastor shuts up and stops talking. Maybe it starts to go into my life group time. Maybe it goes to my dinner table. Then as I'm going to the grocery store and as I go to work and as I talk to my kids and as I answer that phone call and as I go, I make disciples. That may require a heart shift for somebody in this room, though. It does for me on a daily basis. I think it should, can be a constant shifting. We shift from the stands to the field. Can I ask you a question? Is it time to get in the game to use the gifts that God has given you. And let me tell you about your gift. I don't know what it is. Can I tell you what I know about it, though? It's enough. It's enough. Because you're enough? No, you're not. But he is. He already, always has been, and he always will be. Last thing, and this is maybe something that will help you the most this week to engage in and maybe employ these principles, and it's this, from self-effort to Jesus-empowered. From self-effort to Jesus empowered. You ever gotten up in your faith and said, I'm just going to try harder today. Gosh, kind of 
Just try harder. Come on, Kevin, try harder. And then you find that your effort just falls short time and time again. Maybe it's because you're not tapping into the strength that's available to you. Verse 11 in this passage continues on after we talk about being stewards of God's grace. Whoever speaks as do it as one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength. This is underlined in my Bible. By the strength God supplies. Not by my self-effort, but by the strength that he already has given to me. He's gifted me with. It's available to me in order that in everything, God might be glorified through Christ Jesus. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. But it's by the strength God supplies, not what I bring to the table. A healthy church life, a healthy disciple maker flows from Jesus, not from me. In John chapter 17, it's one of the key parts in your study you will look at. Jesus, I won't read it to you today, but he simply says what he has done. He's praying. It's the high priestly prayer. It's right before he would be arrested and crucified on our behalf. And he's praying and saying that he's accomplished the work that God had given him to do. And the question is, what is that work? The work was making disciples. He raised up disciples who would then go and make disciples. Not only did he complete that message, he commissioned the messengers. That's in your notes. Jesus completed the message, but he also commissioned the messengers. That's you and that's me. He completed the work he came to do of making disciples who could then go and make disciples. And that's why we're here today to go and make more disciples, to pass our faith along to other people. He didn't just accomplish the what of the gospel. He showed us the how. Somebody needs to hear that again. That'll change how you look at the Bible and read scripture. Jesus didn't just accomplish the what of the gospel. He showed us the how. We don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with us because he has been tempted as we are tempted, yet he was without sin, and he showed us how to go about making disciples. So today, can we merge the message of Jesus with the methods of Jesus in our life? He completed the message. That part's done. That's why it's good news. It already happened. But he's now commissioned the messengers. I'm going to ask you just to bow your heads with me and close your eyes today. Nobody's looking around because today I believe with all of my heart that somebody in this building is a believer and God has commissioned you a different way and your heart has shifted towards some things that he has for you. But the most important thing that's gonna happen in this room today is somebody needs to shift your heart over to Jesus because you've been told what salvation is and how you can be saved and you haven't believed it yet because you know you too well and you don't think maybe that you're good enough. But if I were to ask you today, if you were to die today, if today was your last day, do you know for certain that you would spend eternity with God in heaven? Today's message has been primarily to people that know Jesus. But as we've looked at the gospel, I have no doubt in my mind that God has stirred your heart. If you couldn't say yes to that question, you would say, I'd like to know that I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, that I'm saved, but I just don't fully know that I've got that nailed down. I don't know that if I were to die today, I'd spend eternity with Jesus in heaven. If that is you, I've got good news for you. Jesus already paid the price and he knew what your sin would be when he paid that price while he was on that cross. You were on his mind. And nobody's looking around. This is just you and Jesus for a moment. If that is you, I believe he's stirring something inside of you in this moment. For you, salvation doesn't come through a prayer. I'm not even gonna lead you in a prayer because I think inside of you, your heart is screaming a prayer. Prayer is just our mode of talking to God. It's how we reach out to him. And in your heart, you already feel that tug. And I would challenge you, cry out to him in the silence of this moment or out loud or step away, whatever you need to do, but speak to him because salvation is this simple. Jesus paid the price for your sin that separated you from God. He lived the sinless life you could never live. And when he died on that cross, he was your sacrifice, paying the price you could never pay. And it didn't stop there. Not only did he pay that price, he took it to the grave and three days later he walked out of that grave because we don't serve a God who's cooped up in a tomb because he walked out and when he walked out he held in his hand the keys to unlock the boundaries the barriers 
the sin stranglehold on your life that gives us nothing but hell and says, I have won the victory. And so salvation is saying, I accept by grace through faith this free gift of salvation that only Jesus could pay for. So today, Jesus, forgive me and save me. I'm yours. You cry that out from your heart to his. Turn your heart to him away from you trying to save you and ask him to do it and he'll do it in this moment. Will you ask him if that's you right now? Nobody's looking around. Cry out to him. He's been saving souls for centuries and he'll do it again. He'll do it today. He'll do it right now. Nobody's looking around. If you've taken that step, I wanna ask you to just acknowledge that. We're not gonna take you out of the service. I just wanna give you next steps that you can take on your own to continue this walk of faith. If that is you, nobody's looking around. What I'm gonna do is I wanna ask you before me and God just to acknowledge that, to say today is that day for me. Put a stake in the ground that today was that day. So on the count of three, if you took that step, you cried out to Jesus and you have taken that step today, on the count of three, I wanna ask you to slip your hand up and just say, Pastor, pray for me. You ready to do that? Right on three. One, two, three. Raise your hand. God bless you and you and you and you and you. Who else? Wave me down. Praise God. Anybody else? God bless you. God bless you. Put your hands down anybody else. Thank God. The angels in heaven are rejoicing right now because God could reach down to sinners who need a savior like you and me. And so God, today I say thank you for that, that you've been saving people for centuries and you'll do it again, and you just did. And so God, we join the chorus of angels in heaven and thank you for salvation that comes through the gospel on a day where we've looked at the marching orders of Christians. God, you have recruited new ministers, people, to go out and march with us together as we shift from me to we, as we shift from the stands to the field, and as we shift from being self-empowered to Jesus-empowered. God, let our self-effort be put to rest and be empowered by a Jesus who holds all power and all authority. And God, we celebrate with the angels in heaven with our new family members, and because you hold that authority, the name above every name is who we pray through and because of today. It's the name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen. Let's celebrate. Welcome these to the family of God today.